Hello, and welcome to episode two in the Governance Blueprint series. My name is John Landgrave, and I'm a Power Platform Architect with Microsoft. In the last episode, we looked at the considerations for developing your governance strategy using a blueprint. In this episode, we're going to focus on the first step in implementing that blueprint. The default environment is important because not only is it there when your tenant is provisioned, but also every user in your organization who's granted a license will be a maker in that environment. So it's critical to make sure that the default environment is configured correctly and according to the policy that you'll implement for your governance. So what are the steps in securing your default environment? Well, first we want to make sure that the only people who can create environments are the ones who your company policy says should be able to create environments. We also need to determine who's going to be an administrator for the Power Platform and the process for assigning administrators to the Power Platform as well. You'll need to know how to check capacity to make sure that you have the storage you need to create additional environments for business applications or to allow people to create their Dataverse for Teams environments. We're going to want to establish a default data loss prevention policy these data loss prevention policies ensure that users within a specific environment can only use the connectors that you have allowed them to use. We're going to make sure that the default environment is configured appropriately for Office 365 extensibility applications. And finally, but optionally, you may decide that you want to limit the use of sharing applications from the default environment. And we'll look at how you can do that as well. So let's get started. Let's dive right in. To configure the default environment, you'll first need to navigate to the Power Platform Admin Center at aka.ms slash ppac. In order to access any of the default environment settings or other environment settings, you'll need to have at least a Power Platform Admin permission as well. And we'll look in a minute at how you configure that. So we, to look at the settings for the default environment, we'll go up here and look at the gear and then choose Power Platform Settings. This is where you'll set organization-wide settings for the Power Platform environment. So you'll notice there are four options here. The first one allows you to identify who can create a production or sandbox environment. By default, this is set to everyone. If you want to limit the environment creation to only administrative people, then you need to click this Only Specific Admins option. You also have the ability to create trial environments. Trial environments are available for 30 days and could be created by anyone if you allowed it. The thing to keep in mind is that if someone creates a trial environment and begins building applications and then the application goes away, then all their work will go away as well. We generally recommend that you create trial environments on behalf of your users rather than allowing them to create their own. To do this, you'll want to choose only specific admins. There are also several different add-ons that you can put in an environment. For example, Perflow licenses or AI Builder credits. Now you can either let any environment admin add those or you can have only specific admins who are allowed to add additional capacity. The reason you may not want to allow any environment admin is that you are allowed to assign a user in a department to an administrator of their own environment. In order to implement centralized management of add-ons, it's best to choose only specific admins here. And finally, we just enable a new capability called tenant-level analytics. And tenant-level analytics allow any environment admin to see the analytics around the specific environments for which they have administrative permission. In order to give this capability to your environment admins, you have to turn it on here first. And once this is turned on, we'll begin generating these analytics and you'll be able to go view them inside of the environment. So once you save your settings, we can move on to the next step. Now that we've looked at limiting environment creation and management at the tenant level, let's look at how you would assign additional admins if you choose to do so. To do this, you're going to go into the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. So you'll typically need a global tenant admin who can help you with this. Once inside of the Admin Center, you can simply go in and edit a specific user. From here, you'll notice I have the ability to go in and manage their roles. 
And as you'll see, they have no administrator access today. Once I've selected role management from the main user screen, you'll notice I had the option here to go through and assign different roles. So I'm going to go click on Admin Center Access, but I'm not going to select any of these options because I don't want them to come into this interface in order to manage the Power Platform. Instead, I'll scroll down and I'll look at the other options for collaboration by category. And you'll notice that there is an option here to give someone Power Platform Admin permission. So by giving them this permission, they become a Power Platform Admin and they can, they can use the Power Platform Admin Center to affect change on any of the environments that have been created inside of your tenant. And it's as simple as that. Once you've assigned the Power Platform Admin permission, that user can now go into the Power Platform Admin Center and look at other settings or make changes. One of the key settings you'll want to look at is how much capacity you have in your environment. So for example, if I drop down the resources chevron and pick capacity, this will show me the different types of capacity that I have inside of my tenant. As I mentioned before, there are two different storage pools and those two different storage pools cover the default environment as well as business environments. And then the other storage pool is for Microsoft Teams environments that use Dataverse for Teams. In this particular case, my database storage is about 60 gig of which 15 is used. The storage is basically in three buckets, database, file, and log storage. If I look at Microsoft Teams, however, you'll notice that I have three environments. It shows me that those three environments are each have two gig total available to them. And overall, I have 1.6 gig of two, two total gig used. Now, in this particular case, this is a test environment. It doesn't show me all of the environments that I have available. But as I mentioned earlier, what you will see here when you look at your Power Platform Admin Center is the number of environments roughly equal to the number of users you have licensed divided by 20. Finally, let's go look at how we would set up our data policies. So under Policies, you'll notice I have this Data Policies option, which I'll pick. And in my particular environment, I have two policies set up. I have one policy set up as my default policy and another one that's for my developer environments. So let's look at how you'd create your own default policy. I'll click on the New Policy button, and now I'll give it a name. I would name this something like Default Policy. Now, as I go through these different options, you'll notice that my first option is the ability to assign the pre-built connectors and to give them different categories. The categories available to me are business, non-business, and blocked. And you'll notice that currently non-business is set to default. And what that means is that anytime we add new connectors, they will go into the non-business category. Now these categories work as follows. Any connectors that are put into the business bucket can talk to each other. Any connectors put in the non-business bucket can talk to each other. And anything that's blocked cannot talk to anything. So generally speaking, you'll want to put things in the business policy bucket that are there for that environment to consume. And the only reason you put things in the non-business bucket is if you need the connector there for some administrative procedure or something else, but you don't want it to integrate with the other connectors. And blocking, of course, will mean that that connector cannot be used in this environment. You'll also notice that not everything is blockable. So SQL Server is blockable, Outlook is not. So as I mentioned before, the default environment is primarily for Office 365 extensibility. And for that reason, what we really want to do is have in the business category all of the connectors that are non-blockable that are in use by Office. So one easy way to accomplish this is to use the blockable drop-down and only identify those connectors that are not blockable. Now I can see that these connectors are all things that are used basically with Microsoft Office. So to start, I'm going to take all of these connectors and by clicking at the top of this column, it will select all of these non-blockable connectors. And I'm going to move those into the business bucket. I'm then going to go back in non-business, clear my filters, and take everything else and block those. 
And so now what I have are in my business bucket, I have all of the non-blockable connectors. So once I've done this, you'll notice that all of the connectors that are in the business bucket are office connectors with a couple of exceptions. And I'm going to want to take those out of my business bucket and put them in non-business since I can't block them. So the first one is cloud app security, which most users won't need to access with a connector. And then the other one is the Dynamics 365 customer voice connector. So I'm simply going to move those to non-business. And so now those can't be used in concert with the other office connectors. The final thing I want you to notice is that currently non-business is the default group into which new connectors will be placed. If we want to make sure that as new connectors are added to the system, they can't be used unless you assign them to an environment in a different bucket, then we'll want to make the default group block. Click set default group and set it to blocked, then now any new connector, unless it is non-blockable, will go into the blocked bucket. If we add a non-blockable connector, then that would go into the non-business bucket by default. Once I've assigned the pre-built connectors to buckets, I want to go set some rules for how custom connectors can be used. So custom connectors in an environment can only access endpoints that I've allowed through this custom connector setting. And you'll notice today I'm ignoring all custom connectors. So even if a user builds and adds a custom connector to an environment, they won't be able to connect anything. So let's say, for example, I'm with Contoso.com and I want people to be able to create custom connectors and attach them to internal Contoso endpoints. I would go in and add a new connector pattern in this case, I want this to apply to custom connectors placed in the business group. And I want to specify that not only do they have to be secure, so HTTPS, but the only endpoint they can come to is at star.contoso.com. I also want this to be first in order. And so by setting this, a custom connector in the business group is allowed to connect securely to any endpoint that's star.contoso.com. Anything else will be ignored. Now, after setting my connector buckets and my custom connector policy, I need to go through and identify which environments this policy will be enforced for. So in this specific case, because this is the default environment that I'm configuring, I'm going to click Add All Environments. What this will do is set this configuration for the default environment and any additional environment that gets created, whether it's a business environment or a Dataverse for Teams environment, will have these rules applied. If I have an environment that I don't want to be included in this particular policy, then I can go in, either now or later, and exclude certain environments, and then pick the environment that I want to have excluded. So for example, if I want to have the maker's environment be excluded from this policy, then I simply pick that and add it to the policy. And now when I go to review the policy, you'll see that I have my connector bucket set, I have con custom connector patterns put together, and I have certain environments excluded from this policy, and I picked one of those environments. And now creating policy will create this policy and make it the standard policy. So let's recap the steps we've gone through so far to secure your default environment. We first showed you how to limit the environment creation, and then also how to identify who would get admin capability, whether it would be everyone or only certain admins. We've shown you how to use the Microsoft 365 Admin Center to assign admin permissions. We've shown you how to check the capacity of your tenant, so you can add additional environments if space is available. And we've shown you how to configure the default data loss prevention policy. Now, in many cases, you may also want to limit the ability to share applications outside of SharePoint. It's really important to make this distinction, however, because the way this works is that SharePoint uses its own permission system and uses the Power Platform to display custom forms and to execute flows. So the permissions for embedded custom forms in SharePoint are managed by SharePoint and not by the Power Platform Admin Center. But if you are writing Canvas apps that are inside of the default environment and you're concerned about people sharing these Canvas apps with large numbers of people, 
there's one way to limit that, and that is to go in and to limit application sharing so only specific people inside of the environment can share applications, otherwise they can't. I have a link here to how you configure this, and we'll make sure that you have this at the end of this episode so you can go check out how you can accomplish this. So in this episode, we've looked at the settings to secure your default environment. In episode three, we'll look at the tenant-wide settings that apply to all environments across your tenant. Yeah.